This week, I took my time machine back to the year 1865, and I found a bad guy. A bit of a celebrity for his time, in fact. The story of this bad guy is so complex, so fascinating, so consequential to American history that I needed to bring a guest along for the ride this time. So hop aboard and we'll whisk you off for a night at the theater to witness the performance of several lifetimes. We're talking about John Wilkes Booth on this two-part episode of Vintage Villains. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Allison Dixon, and as I said before, this week's villain is a bit of a historical heavyweight. As my guest and I will detail over the next couple episodes, the actions of John Wilkes Booth alone were enough to alter the fabric of time in such a way that we feel those wrinkles increases even now. But as you'll see during our cruise on the Zeitgeist Zeppelin, as I am now calling it, hat tip to my buddy Chris, the year of 1865 was already teeming with activity, thanks in large part to the fact that the United States had been in the grip of its own civil war for the last four years. Things were not looking too good for the South by January, and Robert E. Lee would officially surrender in April. But we'll be talking a whole lot about that in the coming episodes. So what else was going on in 1865 while the war raged on and later the country reeled from the assassination of its president? What was life like for Americans during this time? Well, on January 4th, the New York Stock Exchange opened its first permanent headquarters on Broad Street, which isn't too far from Wall Street. On January 16th, General William Tecumseh Sherman issued Field Order No. 15, which redistributed roughly 400,000 confiscated acres of land in Low Country, Georgia and South Carolina in 40-acre plots to newly freed Black families. You might recognize the phrase, 40 acres and a mule. Well, it was born here. The Freedmen's Bureau was established in March of 1865. It gave legal title for 40-acre plots to African Americans and white Southern Unionists. The Freedmen's Bureau was just one of many attempts to create a more egalitarian system after the war, but was repeatedly undermined by lack of funding and other political roadblocks, mostly whites who didn't want to cede any ground to their fellow black citizens. It was intended to be temporary, and it did help a lot of people. At its peak during Reconstruction, the Freedmen's Bureau had 900 agents across 11 southern states, and they handled everything from distributing clothing and food to building schools and protecting the freedmen from the Ku Klux Klan. In the years following the war, however, President Andrew Johnson would return most of the land to former white slave owners during the Reconstruction, or those whites found other ways to continue to subjugate freed blacks by enacting various vagrancy laws, which would allow them to imprison those who they believed led idle or disorderly lives, or it would allow white employers to take the children of black workers if they found them to be destitute or unfit. This was, of course, after creating a system of complete economic disenfranchisement in the first place. So if you think for one moment the abolition of slavery led to the end of the problems here, well, I doubt you're still listening to this anyway, and you're going to be needing a way deeper education than you'd be getting from me. So let's roll on. And speaking of the abolishment of slavery, at least on paper, on February 1st, 1865, President Lincoln signed the 13th Amendment of the Constitution, abolishing slavery in the United States. On April 27th, only two weeks after Lincoln's death, the steamboat SS Sultana exploded on the Mississippi River, killing around 1,800 of the 2,400 passengers on board in what would become the worst maritime disaster in U.S. history. Most of the passengers were paroled Union POWs on their way home. 
On May 10th, President Andrew Johnson issued a proclamation declaring the end of armed resistance in the South, making this date the most commonly accepted as the end of the American Civil War. But hold your horses. A lot of fighting was still going on, and Robert E. Lee was only one general. There were many others, and they didn't all get the memo from D.C., nor did they want said memo. It would take well over a year before fighting finally stopped across the South. On June 19th, Union General Gordon Granger declared slaves free in Texas. This date of June 19th, as you may know, is now officially celebrated across the U.S. as Juneteenth. On July 2nd, a brand new army was formed over in the UK that would soon spread across the world. It was started by a Methodist Reformed Church minister, William Booth, and his wife, Catherine. It was first known as the East London Christian Mission, but you all now know it as the Salvation Army, and it is the largest non-government provider of social services in the United States, and not without a whole lot of controversy. A few days later, on the 5th of July, the U.S. Secret Service began operating under the Treasury Department. As you can imagine, we'll be talking a bit more about the Secret Service in these next couple episodes. They weren't protecting the president at this point, but were mainly tasked with the tracking of counterfeit cash. In artistic news, on November 26th, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland began taking people on a delightfully surreal trip through the looking glass. And that should do it for our short trip in time. After all, we have a guest waiting, and that guest is one you've heard before on my other show, Ding Dong Darkness Time, where we spoke about werewolves in one episode and the book Gone Girl in another. That's right, my friend Jason Blair from the Silver Linings Handbook podcast is with us today. And it just so happens he's a perfect guest for this topic because he was born and raised and currently lives in the general area where this all went down. And he brought with him a whole steamer trunk full of geographical and historical insight. So without further ado, let's jump into the conversation, shall we? Doing the dive that I did for this episode was really my biggest dive into the topic at hand. I had the general gist of the John Wilkes Booth assassinates Abraham Lincoln at the theater in my head throughout most of my, you know, childhood and schooling and everything. But I didn't really know how wide ranging and complex this story is and how absolutely wild. It is a story that would make an incredible movie if you didn't know it was already a real thing. Oh, absolutely. You know, so I am a Marylander by birth, Southern by the grace of God. Um, and I went to high school in Virginia. So, and then my mom's family's from the Northern Neck, where our story is going to sort of end. Sort of end. Sort of, um, yeah. So, so I've been hearing about Booth my entire life, just like I've been hearing about Poe my entire life. Oh, of right? course. Like, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So it's always been a fascinating thing for me. And it's very funny. So recently, I don't know, this was like November? November, I was actually down in um, the northern neck of Virginia in King George uh, County and, you know, took a wrong turn totally and literally passed the spots that he crossed. And then, you know, a year before that, near the Garrett farmhouse, a year before that, I was you know, at Fort McNair in Washington, D.C., just walking around and tripped across the uh, the Grand Hall where the trial was there. So John Wilkes Booth has been stalking me a little bit recently. So this <laughs> perfect timing. Because, of course, as I drive by, literally, Allison, I'm not even kidding. I drive by and I'm like, Port Conway. Oh, this is so familiar. Oh, Booth. So I pull off in this new subdivision. And I start, like, reading articles on it, sitting while I'm supposed to be home anytime now. So that's a very typical Jason moment. <laughs> it is awesome that you're here for this because I noticed your uh, acumen on the topic, you know, months before I even decided to do, well, A, this podcast and be an episode about John Wilkes Booth. You were bringing up all sorts of players that we'll mention today, like Mary Surratt and Samuel Mudd. And again, we'll get all into that. I knew that you had a a brain for this topic and then learning, of course, yeah, your birthplace. John Wilkes Booth was born in Bel Air, uh, Maryland, not far from uh, Baltimore. 
So being able to get a sense of the lay of the land, because I haven't been up to that part of the country myself yet. And, you know, it's such a concentrated area of American history, early American history. And I imagine you can just sort of feel it everywhere you go. Yeah, it's very fascinating area. It's you know, a rural area, a lot of it's on the Chesapeake Bay. So it's like flat farms. And it's, I mean, it's unbelievably gorgeous near the Susquehanna River and all of those things north of Baltimore. I think a lot of people don't realize how nice it is. But Bel Air itself is an interesting place. So it's um, a town in Hartford County. Mm -hmm. And it's like a bedroom community of Baltimore now. But really, like at the time that Booth was born, there were like, under 200 residents in the area. Its claim to fame was and may still be home to Elijah Bond, the maker of the Ouija board. Oh, interesting. Um, so Ooh. they've got him and Booth. Uh, but like it has a, it has a very interesting history. The county is home to Harvard of Grace, which is like both a home to Hall of Fame Baltimore Orioles shortstop Cal Ripken Jr. and it was once considered for capital of the United States before D.C. was selected because it's on the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. So you could get weapons and other things in and keep it um, well defended. But the area, I think a lot of people, because Maryland was on the Union side in the war, some people think of it as an anti-slavery state. But it was a slave state that stayed in the union in part because they voted that way, but also in part because they wouldn't have had a choice because right. with the Capitol in DC, Lincoln would have um, forced it. But like, it's also an area where in the 1810s and the 1820s, it was the home of like Patty Cannon, who was like an illegal slave trader, serial killer. Wow. And she might have uh, to be on this show at some point. Yes, I, I think she would be great. <laughs> Actually, now that I think about it, I'd totally come back for that episode. She was the co-leader of this thing called the Cannon Johnson Gang. And, uh, and they roamed Maryland and Delaware. And among other things, they abducted like hundreds of fugitive slaves and free black people wow. and then went around and sold them, including the free black people, into slavery in Alabama, Mississippi and other southern states. They called it actually the reverse underground railroad oh my gosh and yeah and so it's a it's a very interesting mixed history to this day there's a debate about maryland's flag because what it represents right now is the union and the confederate side coming together post-civil war the politics of maryland really struck me when i was researching this and i will cover that here in a second because Again, I didn't realize, too, a lot of people really do think in the binary when it comes to the Civil War that North Blue or Union, South Red, South Confederate. Mm -hmm. But there, are, that line between North and South, especially where it meets around the Virginia, Maryland area, you're going to find a lot of blurring of those lines in that part of the country and in a lot of parts of the country. In fact, the Civil War... I want to really nail the environment and the time. I feel like a lot of people don't like to study this part of American history because they feel that it's a little too far removed. They feel that it's a little boring. Unfortunately, they were probably forced to watch awful film strips on it or listen to a droning history teacher in middle school, and they just developed sort of a blockade of interest. But I tell you what, this part of American history is both a fascinating in that it's not that long ago, to be honest yeah. with you. And it really brings home the fact that this country is still very much in its overall infancy. And we're still reeling from the effects of this war. Here's a thought for you. It's like in America, and there are lots of th upsides to America, but one of the difficult things in America is we have no binary culture. There is yeah. no American culture. It's a bunch of different cultures um, you know, when they first named it the United States, the U in United was always written out as small because they really did see themselves as sovereign, independent states. Yes. And so, yeah. And so it's it's kind of an interesting, it's an interesting element of it because you get there and not to jump ahead in the timeline, but Booth's born in 1838, I think. 
1850, the Fugitive Slave Act is passed as a part of the Compromise of 1850, where, you know, it's really at that point, this compromise between the Southerners and the Northern, what they called Free Soilers, who were like a political party at the time. And the law basically penalized officials uh, who didn't arrest fugitive slaves. And you could get fined for like $1,000. And it wreaked havoc on Maryland. Because as a slave state, it was the conduit to get to the North. Yes. And what the North really was, was if you were a slave trying to escape, you really wanted to escape to Canada. Yes. And that was the place to go. And Maryland is not only a safe slave state with uh, Northern sympathies or abolitionist sympathies, it's also the conduit right, uh, from the Deep South to the North and from the North back down to the Deep South if you're a fugitive slave. You know, it's really interesting too, when you mentioned Canada, I would love to look more into Canada's role in the American Civil War because you have Quebec uh, playing a role with the Confederacy. And, you know, Quebec is um, its own version of sort of we're part of this country, but not we're sort of our, you know, they, they probably really ha have some sympathies in, in a lot of ways with the Confederate um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. side. And so... Um, as we'll see, there's some play back and forth between sort of the brass of the Confederate army. Um, and then uh, so knowing that, you know, freed slaves would want to flee to Canada, but maybe not Quebec. I don't know. Um, I, I'm just curious to see how all that interplays, because you can't just have a war like our civil war was and not have the borders, the border countries kind of wondering okay yeah. what's going on and it also had implications for them too right oh for sure yeah, but, i mean there. trade and you know yeah. all these things and so here we are in the year 1865 this is really when it's all starting to pop off here the the war ended in 1865 uh lincoln you know just uh, as a foreshadowing here will be assassinated by april so it's a hell of a year. And yeah. at a time when you really think about it, the last four years, the country has been plunged into a battle with itself and it spared no expense when it came to casualties. We lost 620,000 soldiers in the Civil War. More in Antietam than any other war except for Vietnam, I think. Yeah, they said that, uh, you know, according to our own national uh, parks, yeah, that's uh, approximately equal to the fatalities in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Mexican War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, and the Korean War combined. Combined. Yep. And yep. I like to think about it this way. If we fought the Civil War today in 2024 and lost the same percentage of lives to the current American population, we Ooh. would have 6 million dead. Mm -hmm. Yep. Out of like 350 million, is that where we're at now? Yeah. Like yeah. So roughly 2% of the population. That would be more people than we have in our military today. Uh, we only uh, have like 2 million. Unbelievable. Yeah. And we've lost... In perspective here, 1.1 million to COVID over the last three or so years, 1.1 million Americans. Uh, and when you think about the disruption that that alone caused, uh, that ought to paint a, a pretty reliable picture of what that much death did to our country, to our people, to our generations, to uh, so much death. And it becomes sort of ingrained in the the soul of a country to yep. to have that much death and destruction so to really think about what the psychology of this country was going through at the time we'll just say things were a little frail well and you have that enormous level of animosity going on at the time and also fear right right and when people people will say things like the Southern way of life was threatened, but it's not just the racism. It's the economic way of life. Yes. It's all the fears that are associated with that. There's the fear of like race mixing and fears of all these different things. And regardless of whether these fears are legitimate or not, like they are huge factors. Fear often will 
drive these um, these types of things. You know, and one of the things about Booth and how it impacted his family during the Civil War, they were an acting family, and I'm sure we'll dive into this, but, you know, they were well-known actors mm-hmm. all over. But, you know, an interesting thing about him, we roll back to the beginning, back in 1838, this is a fun fact. Or no, not 38, I'm sorry. It's 1850s, right? And yeah. so he's trying to, I've always said this about John Wilkes Booth, he's like Hitler, if Hitler had gone to art school, if Booth had been a better actor. Yeah. Um, the, but but one of the things that they say about him that got in the way of his ability to be a good actor was that, you know, he showed a little bit of a temper, a little emotional instability, mm-hmm. but they said it was his egocentricity. Yes. So he basically struggled with seeing other people's per- perspectives which makes it really hard to see the big picture. And right. I think we'll see that in the story that he's kind of like missing the big picture. Oh yeah. And uh yeah, and things like that. And I'm I'm, I'm sure we'll dive into his little competition with his brother and all oh, stuff like that. Oh, but. the the sibling rivalry was mm-hmm. real. Um yeah. and uh, to really get a sense of this story and sort of the very cosmic fate feeling that sort of surrounds all of this we're talking very big personalities we're talking very consequential things that are all kind of popping off at the same time to really culminate in the death of an american president at the end of a conflict that killed has killed 620,000 americans over 4 years so imagine coming out of World War II or or Vietnam or any other big American conflict. Imagine coming out of the pandemic or something and having, say, Nicolas Cage assassinate the president of the United States. <laughs> so just I'm trying to put pe- modern people in the mind frame, because when I say Nicolas Cage, it I, is about that absurd or like Charlie Sheen. Yeah, right? Charlie like- Sheen. you know what? I almost <laughs> want to go back because I use Nick Cage for my guy. You're but I like the idiot of the acting family kills the president (laughs) right yes (laughs) i'm gonna say charlie sheen now i'm gonna i have nick cage in my outline but jason i am switching to charlie sheen this is perfect because these two men share something in common and that is something that i refer to as dynastic celebrity or what Mm. gen z might call nepo babies and so we have like say the legendary coppola clan from which nicholas cage hails or the Baldwins, or the Arquettes, the Barrymores, the Sheens, Angelina Jolie, the Scars Guards. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. these these acting families, the Booths were very much of that ilk. There were nine siblings in this family. Three of those nine from the Booth family would go on to become actors. That would be Edwin, John Wilkes Booth, and Junius Junior. And we'll get to Junius Senior in a second because. If we're talking about vintage villains here, we are going to talk about the villains and we're going to learn about what maybe makes them tick. John and Edwin Booth would become the most famous of the brothers. Uh, Edwin was hailed and is to this day by many theater historians as probably the greatest actor of the 19th century, depending Mm -hmm. on on who you ask. And in fact, Edwin was known all over the world. He held the record for playing Hamlet in 100 performances. And that record would later be broken in 1922 by John Barrymore. Again, another legendary acting family here. Yeah. And the brother's parents. Now we have Junius Booth. And their mother, Marianne Holmes, and she was actually Booth's mistress, and he was able to get a divorce after that, marry her. And they were both well-known Shakespearean actors from Great Britain. Tisk, 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 tisk. The Shakespearean, and this is probably (laughs) the most Shakespearean American history story Story. of all time, really, when you think about it. Um. And they would eventually relocate to the United States and settle on a 150-acre farm outside Bel Air, Maryland, where they would have 10 kids. John Wilkes Booth was number nine in that lineup. So talk about middle child times, however many at this point. I think when you're at the tail end of nine siblings, you're mostly raising yourself or being raised by one of your other siblings at that point. Um, And I think that plays a lot into 
John's immaturity and that sort of inability to, I don't know. I, I think See outside that, of himself. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're fighting to be noticed by any means necessary. I think when you have nine other siblings around you vying for the same two parents, the love of those same two parents, I think it's going to create some interesting challenges. I'd love to hear from more uh, people who are siblings from massive families. Well, both my parents, both my parents are like nine plus uh, wow. families. Yeah. And I, I do think there's, so my mom's on the older end, my dad's on the younger end of his family. And I do think that plays out. And I think it plays out with Booth in a very interesting way, because if you look at his trajectory, he first goes to Baltimore, is very unsuccessful trying out as an right. actor there. Ends up in Philly, but then ends up in Richmond eventually, right? So like second tier, third tier, right? You know, it would be like off, 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 off Broadway today. Um, yeah, but, like small town theater. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think Booth a wanted to be dramatic, so in a weird way, he created his own giant play with the assassination. But I think the other thing is he wanted to be accepted, and yes. you would see his sympathies. Once he moved to Richmond, um, started to shift significantly because I think it was 1850, 1859, he joined the Shakespeare Stock Company in, in Richmond. And then by later that year, when John Brown was, um, after not really showing much of a sort of pro slavery attitude, although a little bit, um, you know, when John Brown, the abolitionist who took Harper's Ferry, was executed, uh, John Wilkes Booth volunteered for the militia to be a part of it and became outspoken anti-Lincoln even before the before the Civil War. I think a lot of it was just to conform. I mean, I don't know. I haven't interviewed him. Would love to. But yeah. <laughs> uh, my time machine is not built yet. Lord knows there would be a lot it. of things I would do if I had that time oh, machine. Oh, you and me both. Um. Uh, um, but but I do think like some of that is um, at play in all of it. It is interesting to see how he's described by his um, teachers and those who knew him as as a teenager, that he was very athletic. He was very strong and witty. Uh, his teacher said he was smart, but he just again, as the, as a lot of teachers say what they said to me, what they said to both my kids, my husband, they just don't apply themselves. Um, smart, but, you know, I'm a, I was a raging C student all through high school. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I was just happy I graduated. So he ended up dropping out of school at age 14. And he would begin again, like, as you said, he would begin acting in earnest uh, around age 17. And there was a lot of trial and error. His brother Edwin, though, sort of, I think, would help grease the skids a little bit. And his father. These were 10 kids underneath this roof. But this family was not poorly off in any way. No, uh, They were very, they were wealthy. They were living a pretty nice life. Pretty prosperous for that area. I know they had like black servants and, and slaves and whatnot mm -hmm. on their farm. So that pro-slavery mentality, I think, was kind of winding through that family mm -hmm. uh, a, a good dip. But Edwin... Not so much. Edwin was uh, the abolitionist. Edwin was pro-union. Yep. And that created a bit of a feud because what would happen is you would look at Edwin, who was this luminary himself, known all over the world and very much beloved on the stage in theaters of New York and Chicago. He pretty much told his brother, why don't you head south um, yes. and, and secure the theaters down there, little bro, and head pat and off you go. Where and, you belong. And, <laughs> right. And I think that OK, you're going to head south where there's already some more strong Confederate sentiments. You're sort of in, uh, ingratiating yourself among the culture down there and maybe you already have that bent in you. But you're also probably driven a little bit by the fact that you're sort of, quote unquote, liberal douche actor brother. brother. Uh, you want to be unlike him. And so, like, you know, you mentioned they had that very large farm. Yeah, I think the way it seems to have played out is that if you look at the parents, you wouldn't necessarily call them pro-slavery as much as they were necessary evil. Right. And then, naturally, you have one child who's like, why would you do this, right? Who mm -hmm. becomes Edwin, the abolitionist. And then to sort of 
distinguish himself. Once Booth goes down to Richmond in 1860, he does this tour of the Deep South where he gets, it's the first time he's really acclaimed as an actor. And he really buys into, um, you know, by the time you get to April 12th, 1861, when, you know, the Confederate forces fire on the on Fort Sumter for the first time, and that begins uh, the Civil War. Booth was already a vigorous supporter for the Southern cause, like right. outspoken advocacy for slavery, outspoken hatred for Lincoln, who was elected that same year, 1861. But also kind of played both sides of it. He was in New York briefly. Yes. He, you know, Lincoln saw him. Oh. Perform in a play in 1863. Yeah, there were so many star-crossed moments between those two men leading up to that assassination that it feels, again, like there is something... You can feel the fabric of the universe winding around this story in a, in a way that makes makes you believe in fate. Even if you are generally not that kind of person, I found myself mesmerized by so many of the coincidences that we will see um, in foreshadowing moments. Again, that Shakespearean sort of somebody in the kind of like off screen, you know, the the somebody warning you of the of what's happening ahead, you know, is, is tends to pop up in some of those old plays. You feel that at work in this story. And with Edwin, he was a fixture in those theaters uh, to the north. And and of course, he also traveled the world. So he was well known in Australia and Hawaii. And he also traveled uh, extensively in Europe. So when you think about how slow information traveled back in those days, and like you said, Jason, I mean, it could take days to get a newspaper going, there was no quick information spread back then. It was particularly impressive to achieve the level of fame where people would recognize you on the street, I imagine. Or see your face. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And, yes. you know, John would come to achieve such fame as well, which played a great deal into how Lincoln's assassination was carried out. And, of course, we'll get to that. But Edwin managed several theaters and acting companies in New York City. And a statue of William Shakespeare, which was paid for by the funds raised by... The three brothers, Edwin, Junius Jr., and John, they did a Julius Caesar performance. And the funds from that performance paid for the statue that stands in Central Park to this day. So if you've been to Central Park in New York and you've seen a statue of William Shakespeare, John Wilkes Booth helped get it there. Trust (laughs) me, man. John Wilkes Booth is everywhere. He really is. People have no idea. Yeah. And that was another thing I can't, I wanted to talk about this so badly is because I think a lot of people do not realize it. And you can find a statue of Edwin Booth as well, playing his signature character of Hamlet in the uh, Manhattan's Gramercy Park. And there are memorials to him all over uh, his Maryland birthplace and, and stuff too. But Allison, which brother won the competition? Was it? Was it John? Wait. I don't know. Who's oh. famous? Oh, oh, no, no. Well, okay. That competition. I was like, okay. Well, I, obviously. <laughs> the real I think, competition. You know, in a way, I just want Edwin to be remembered. And, you know, yes. like, come on. Let's, let's <laughs> yes. let Edwin prevail here. That poor man. He was talented. But he isn't just being included here to illustrate the sort of feuding brother dynamic which was very much there and it also isn't because edwin was by all accounts this kind and and graceful man and in addition to his acting talents or that he was a staunch unionist while his brother john was a strident supporter of the confederacy but edwin booth brother of john wilkes booth also unwittingly saved the life of abraham lincoln's son robert only months before John would assassinate Abraham Lincoln. Which, let's just pause for a moment Hmm. and think that one through. Think it through. (laughs) Think it through. The older brother of Mm -hmm. the assassin of Abraham Mm -hmm. Lincoln saved the son (laughs) of Robert Lincoln. And this was completely by accident. So... This is according to some articles I pulled up here. The incident occurred on a train platform in Jersey City, New Jersey, and the exact date is unknown, but it's believed to have taken place in either late 1864 or early 1865. And Robert Lincoln himself recalled the incident in a 1909 letter to uh, Richard Watson Gilder, who was the editor of the Century magazine. 
So basically, they were on the train platform. There was a big crowd. Everybody was kind of crushing to get onto the train. The train started to move, and Robert sort of fell into the gap between the train platform and the car. He was pulled up and secured onto the footing platform uh, by none other than Edwin Booth. And of course, Robert looks up at this man. Imagine again seeing Charlie Sheen. No, Charlie Sheen's brother the glorious Emilio Estevez. Imagine looking up and seeing Emilio Estevez saving your life. And imagine that surreal moment, though, the equivalent of this very famous, well-known actor has saved your life on a train. And Booth didn't know the identity of the man whose life he had saved until many months later when he received a letter from a friend, Colonel Adam Badeau, who was an officer on the staff of Ulysses S. Grant. And uh, he heard the story from Robert Lincoln, who had since joined the uh, Union Army, was also serving on Grant's staff. So this was all verified. This isn't some urban legend. It feels like something that should be. But it would only be a couple months later that uh, John Wilkes Booth would assassinate Abraham Lincoln. So I just think that it's, again, that sort of moment, one of those ripples in time and in all the times and in all the places here uh, where these two families intersect. And I don't know, like, let's let's again go back in time. Would this be like in terms of odds, given where they were and the population being what it was? Is it weird that the Booths and the Lincolns have these kinds of intersections, do you think? Yes, I would say yes. Because if you, even if you think there's a smaller population, you also have to consider just the mere geography. Right? Yeah. Like if all of a sudden you were to go to Atlanta, I was to go to Atlanta right now, what would the odds be that we would run into each other? Uh, yeah, they would be very infinite and unfortunate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd love to run into you in Atlanta. Um, yeah. Hey, <laughs> next year, probably. <laughs> Heck yeah, dude. Let's yeah. do it. So other than hailing from famous families, what else would you say that John Wilkes Booth and either Nicolas Cage or Charlie Sheen have in common? Well, it's also, again, the level of celebrity and how recognizable these guys are. If you ran into Nick Cage, for instance, in public, chances are you'd recognize him immediately. He's just that iconic. His face is on reversible sequin pillows for mm -hmm. crying out loud. By the time John Wilkes Booth would come to assassinate Lincoln, he too would be one of the most well-known faces in the country. And similar to Cage, Booth also had a penchant for energetic and eccentric stage performances. He liked to really chew on the scenery. His athleticism and his apparent thirst trap status, people thought he was really hot. Um, I've looked at pictures. He was all right. I mean, I whatever. Was he 1865 hot? I suppose. Who am I, to judge? Who I am mean, I to judge? he didn't appear to have tuberculosis and, you know, he looked like he was doing okay. So I don't know. Um, by the standards of the time, Sure. He looked like he was really fit. I will say that he was he he was very muscular guy. You could see how he pulled off some of the feats that he did, you know, the night of the assassination. But unsurprisingly, too, uh, Booth would often claim that his favorite character to play was Brutus from Julius Caesar mm. because he slayed a tyrant. But I think, you know, when it comes to Booth um, and Cage or Sheen or any of these guys, is it for every person who thought he was brilliant, there would be another who thought that he was just a nut that was yes. just he was just a he's just a, this outrageous personality. He's not really like, again, Charlie Sheen, man. Yeah. Or or <laughs> yeah, where where your acting abilities are secondary to your persona, Dramatic essentially. Persona. Yeah. And. You know, but I will say this is where I'll probably back off on those comparisons because despite what they do have in common, the Nicolas Cage hasn't killed anyone yet. Right. <laughs> you know, Nicolas Cage is awesome by all accounts, it seems like. I mean, he's a little eccentric, but he, yeah, he hasn't assassinated anyone that we know of. And Booth, honestly, kind of a terrible guy. He was uh, very racist. He had very high charisma, but he had a lot of hatred and jealousy in him. And that kind of grew as the war kind of came to an end and it looked like the South wasn't going to fare terribly well. And he also, he got involved in a lot of financial investments and things that let's just say 
uh, like mineral rights stuff that wouldn't wouldn't benefit people during a civil war. Well, and also, I honestly think he loved just provoking people. Yeah. Like, have you ever heard the story of when he went to New York State? What he said was that uh, the southern states that had left the Union, it was an act of bravery. Yes, yes, that's in right. New York State, hmm. right? He w- he did do that right in the middle of that. You're absolutely right. It was right at the right at the beginning there, and there were quite a few people sort of in his trade and in the entertainment trade that did have Confederate sympathies. So he was, I think, able to skate by. Uh, yeah. with the help of a lot of those people. But I just want you to think that through for a second, right? He's making this announcement in the middle of upstate New York. Yeah, like, yeah. You you were one of those people who just likes to start S. He <laughs> You're doing that. really does. And again, I think it's that ninth brother energy, you know, that, mm-hmm. that sort of, mm-hmm. <laughs> I yep, mean, yep. you're that kid at the dinner table that is just, you know, nobody's listening to you and you're just going to say whatever you want and whatever happens, happens. I think that's kind of. But to your point, despite his views, like critics loved him, mm-hmm. you know, critics loved him. And that was a, it was an interesting thing. And I think we run into this right now too, with actors like Matthew McConaughey, who have political leanings or other people like that. Yeah. That how do you judge the artists and their political views? Can you judge them together? Do they need to be judged separately? How do we, you know, when they're using their acting as a platform for political views, like, do we judge it together? Like, it always for me, like, uh, depends on how outspoken they are and then not only how outspoken they are but how um i guess what they're saying but Mm -hmm. uh you know like for instance i don't know that i have any desire to watch another movie with james woods in it um just because i interesting he has i I still can take him he has crossed a a line for me but i agree (laughs) you know like for this for some reason clint eastwood's okay to me still i I, you know me mel gibson oh yeah and i have total sympathy for mel gibson i do Mm -hmm. because that's like mental health stuff but i still can't watch him no you're right with that with those leanings coming in and i think even back then i think it was such a new phenomenon of having like a these very famous actors and all this like ability to spread news around even if it was still pretty slow at that time you know at least we had an information spreading device called a newspaper word could eventually spread and so we had this opportunity then to kind of line up an actor with their political beliefs and in a way that maybe previous in previous centuries we didn't yeah you know harder to do and so or slower or like any good gossip mill, less accurate. It is interesting yeah. to read sort of his reviews from people of that time because it's almost like reading the reviews of a Mark Wahlberg or a, like, again, a Charlie Sheen or something like where it's like, yeah, you know, he he made a spectacle of himself and it was entertaining, but he's not like he's not Daniel Day Lewis for crying out loud. Mm-hmm. That was Edwin. Um, yep. And Although I, you know, it's interesting, Daniel Day-Lewis played Lincoln in the Spielberg biopic, which I didn't have time to watch, unfortunately. It's good, but a little fanciful, a little fanciful. Okay, yeah, good to know. I think, you know, Lincoln's a bit like Martin Luther King, while there are great things about them, people love to leave out a couple parts here or there. Yes, yes. That in current popular view wouldn't necessarily fit. And we'll talk about some things about Lincoln that... I'm not saying that the Confederacy was correct, but he did some things that I think that if you were... Especially if you were a Marylander. A Maryland, exactly. If you're a Mm -hmm. Marylander or you're just not big on big government or this idea of somebody over on the far end of the country trying to dictate your life out in the middle Mm -hmm. of, you know, the Midwest or whatever or further out, then I can see why he pissed some people off let's just say that because he took some steps but he was also in a very unique position as the president during an american civil war uh no other president has had to deal with this problem since if anything they've been trying to prevent another civil war but john wilkes star as an actor would really rise in the early 1860s and in fact in 1863 this is uh 
Calling back to something we mentioned earlier, Lincoln would see his own future assassin in a play at Ford's Theater, where the assassination took place, from the same box where he would be shot. And at one point during the performance, Booth was said to have shaken his finger in Lincoln's direction as he delivered a line of dialogue. Lincoln's sister-in-law was sitting with him in the same presidential box where he was later slain. She turned to him and said, Mr. Lincoln, he looks as if he meant that for you. And Mm. the president replied, he does look pretty sharp at me, doesn't he? Mm. And Mm. on another occasion, uh, Lincoln's son, Tad, saw Booth perform. He said the actor thrilled him, prompting Booth to give Tad a rose. Uh, Booth ignored an invitation to visit Lincoln between acts. So again, this was in 1863, so a couple years or a year and a half or so before the assassination, this is this moment where imagine if you're looking down at the stage and you see this impassioned delivery taking place. And the play, by the way, was Charles Selby's The Marble Heart. And apparently he had this hmm. this monologue during it that seemed What's rather the marble symbolic heart about. I don't know. Uh, you know what? That's that. that is a good question. It's where he portrayed a Greek sculptor making statues come to life. That is uh, the the general gist of the Marble Heart. And so, during this period, though, Booth would also. This is talking about his business ventures. Um, he tried to get into the oil business. And most of these ventures would fail due to the constraints of the war, particularly with the struggles the South was having at winning. And by 1864, Booth would lose $6,000, which is the equivalent of $1.1 million in today's money in his failed oil venture. And that would only fuel his anger toward Lincoln, who was reelected by a landslide in November of that same year. So So can I jump back for a second? Of course. And take us to two little, uh, one of which is sort of like a less known um, the first assassination attempt of Lincoln. Oh, that's right. So, uh, didn't that go through his hat or something like that? Did well, he? so it was it was February of eighteen sixty one, okay. and Lincoln was in like a what they call like a whistle stop tour en route to his inaug- inauguration. Oh yes, you, you've done the, this topic. Alan the, Pinkerton, yes, founder of the picket, he played a role. He was managing. Uh, the Lincoln security, and this is why we have the Secret Service now, and we don't let private security protect them. And so, you know, Lincoln thought, like, that uh, I think his advisors believed that there was a threat against him. And so they really were concerned as they were going through Baltimore, which tells you something about where Baltimore was. And he got there secretly, I think at some point, like a couple, I, I forget what day it was that he got there, but there actually was a plot uh, Mm -hmm. to assassinate um, Lincoln. And it's part of what led to ultimately the, the creation of the secret service. But there's another thing that happened during the civil war. That's particularly relevant again to Marylanders and give you an idea of where the sympathies were in Maryland during the civil war. Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Yes. Yes. And the, That writ is what allows citizens to petition the court about whether they're to determine if they're being detained lawfully. And the whole point was to impose martial law, be able to detain any Southern sympathizers. Yes. Now, one of the things that I learned of reading about this, that so many people were detained and unable to file a writ. That and think about think about that very basically. Like without the writ of habeas corpus, the cops could come knock on my door and say, "Hey, you're charged. Yep. Charged with what? Whatever. We want you in jail." And there's nothing I could do. There's nothing I could absolutely do. And so this impacted the environment in Maryland during the time. And it was all. It's probably the most strong armed thing Lincoln did. Yes, because it was clearly unconstitutional. Led to the 1878. Posse Comitatus Act, which said the military essentially couldn't come in, yes, um, and impacted Reconstruction. Right, it set back re- set back Reconstruction as well. So I say all of this to say 
that among Marylanders, there was enormous animosity toward Lincoln for how unbelievably strong-armed. In retrospect, a lot of people say, well, it was necessary to protect the capital, and in difficult times, you do difficult things. But like, yeah, the victors tell those stories. Um, right. You know, so it was very much against what the U.S. Constitution was designed to do. And so if you look at Maryland as a state that decided to stay in the Union, it did it with a gun to its head. Oh, very much so. The Maryland legislature voted 53 to 13 against secession. So they didn't want to secede. However, they didn't want federal troops passing through their state. And mm -hmm. you, they were kind of there. They were kind of, the like you said, the conduit. They wanted Lincoln to remove those federal troops. Yeah, the alternate route is through Canada <laughs> or Western Pennsylvania. You but know, but the enough. legislature seemed to have wanted to stay in the Union, but they just didn't really want to be involved in the war. And so that just they're really in a difficult position here. And yeah, so when Lincoln suspended that uh, the writ of habeas corpus and imposed martial law in ba Baltimore and other portions of the state, there were political leaders that were imprisoned at Fort McHenry. There were stationing of federal troops in Baltimore. I mean, it was kind of like Russia, like we imagine Russia now. And again, Booth is from Maryland. So again, if you're the president of the United States, and you're leading the Civil War against the South. Which for you, you say it's a moral cause, right? Yes, And you're yes. suspending the writ of habeas corpus and allowing people to be locked up for no reason whatsoever. And there are so many instances in this whole thing where it's like, yeah, uh, I could see why somebody would be angry enough to try to kill Lincoln because they tried to do it, you know, even before he did all this. Um, yes. And yes. and so they're already sensing the problem. So once he does something like this, whether or not you agree with it, that's not the discussion I'm looking to have. It's the fact that he did it. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of presidents have had the opportunity to do this again. I mean, George W. Bush did it during the Iraq war, did he not? Yep. Overseas. Well, it was the war on terror, let's say. And really the Guantanamo Bay and all, I mean, all those, it, not necessarily here, but, you know, they kind of, it, it kind of did open that door. So, you know, it's one of those discussions. In the Bush case, the Supreme Court mm -hmm. had the time because the war went on so long to right. absolutely repudiate it. And what did they repudiate it with? The Posse Comitatus Act that was pa passed in 1878 and mm -hmm. other laws that are similar. So... The Hamadan decision. There is no, I would say, no room for debate really on the subject of whether Lincoln overstepped his bounds but as we keep on uh, doing uh, it. You know, yes. Think of <laughs> Japanese internment camps where we intern Japanese people, intern German American citizens during uh, World War II. Yeah. Uh, simply because of their national origin or their ethnicity like this is a very american thing which is like we have ideals until mm -hmm. something becomes existential well to me what's the point of an ideal it is to exist when things are existential like, absolutely what's an ideal when i don't have to sacrifice for it right it is yeah so anyway i love lincoln don't get me wrong I'm f I'm free because of him right now. But <laughs> that said, not ideal at times. No, and I think it, there are discussions that could be had though of of extraordinary circumstances requiring extraordinary measures in a, in a sense of where your nation is quite literally tearing itself apart. I agree. But don't expect to make friends. No. And also, maybe don't be so flagrantly in disregard of your own security, but we'll get to that um, <laughs> in a little bit. So all this was happening at the time, the Civil War with Lincoln winning his reelection by landslide in November of 1864 on a platform that advocated abolishing slavery altogether. Uh, Booth, meanwhile, I uh, was devoting his energy and his money to developing a kidnapping plot. They were going to kidnap Abraham Lincoln. And William Seward, the Secretary of War, and Andrew Johnson, Southern sympathizer, ruiner of Reconstruction. Yeah. The man, it, the man who ensured that the South actually won the Civil War. <laughs> uh, and also, let, let us say, by the way, every presidential election that happens, there's always this notion of, 
they should pick a VP from the opposing party, or, you know, that they have complete opposite. Um, Let us remember this lesson of Lincoln and Johnson and the Reconstruction, please. Mm -hmm. This is Mm -hmm. why you do not do that. Um, It's not the wise move, we'll just say. Um, And and honestly, Kennedy and Johnson, to a certain extent, although it kind of they squeaked out the Civil Rights Act. Yeah, right, right. You know, it was it was a bit of a battle. Um, (laughs) But Booth was hell bent on kidnapping Lincoln. And so he had this this band of buddies. We have uh, David Harold, George Atzerodt. Lewis Powell, who's also known as Lewis Payne, I found that uh, in a couple mm-hmm. things, and a rebel agent uh, named John Surratt, I believe it was Mary's son. She was part of this as well. She was the innkeeper, essentially, this boarding house they they owned that a lot of people sort of passed through. So the, the reason they wanted to kidnap Lincoln was to force the release of POWs. There are a couple different rationales that pop up over time. But essentially, releasing prisoners of war, allowing if there is, oh, even stopping the war was a part of it. Like they kept on, they had many different reasons why they, why they wanted to do it. But over and over time, the number of people they were going to kidnap grew. I think too, they wanted to do it in order to, well, when they knew that the war was winding down, I think they wanted to try to prolong it so that they would have an opportunity to say, rebuild their forces and keep fighting because they weren't ready to give up yet. Here's an interesting historical fact that I think a lot of people gloss right over. So April 9, 1965, Robert E. Lee signs the Articles of Surrender and the Appomattox on behalf of the Army of Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. But people consider that the end of the Civil War, but General Joe Johnston was still down in North Carolina and South Carolina trying to run for his life from Tecumseh Sherman. Yes. And so I think part of the reason why they wanted to kidnap or really assassinate by that point Lincoln was it would give Johnston a chance to not surrender and continue fighting, which was, by the way, absurd. If yeah. you knew what was actually happening <laughs> yeah. down there. It was not going to happen. Um, but also think about some of the things that had happened during that time. Sherman had burned Atlanta to Savannah. He yes. had, you know, there. It, it was not looking good for the South if they lost that war. General Order 50, 40 acres and a mule for the slaves. They were going to take the... Uh, the white's land it was not looking good and to give you an idea too of how much loss the south had had suffered uh through this war it's believed that there really wasn't a single household in the south that had not experienced a a death from this war not a single one in some ways you can't be surprised when you still see those sentiments still down there today i mean Mm -hmm. i mean you travel in the deep south especially and you could still very much feel that i'm surprised when i see confederate flags in pennsylvania though yes uh or ohio uh hey guys we were never in the confederacy um maybe it's just wishful thinking but there's a reason why down south when i was living down south they called it the war of northern aggression our friend brett talley and i still call it the war of northern aggression yes yeah it's a it's a whole it's a whole other different way of of thinking about uh things down there and at the very least like I said, regardless of of where your sympathies lie, I think it's important to know these things so that at least you understand like, well, you know, when we have an election or when we have uh, a crisis of some kind and it's like, why are we behaving this way? Why are we doing this? Well, look no further. Well, there's a point. Put yourself in the shoes of other people. Like even when you don't understand why they have their views, even when you adamantly disagree with them. And I'm not saying any of this would have stopped John Wilkes Booth. Right. I mean, but if John Wilkes Booth could have put himself in other people's shoes and other people could put uh, themselves in the shoes of the John Wilkes Booth, yeah. I think we probably would have had a more reasonable road to reconstruction. Something mm-hmm. like Grant, something mm-hmm. like, you know, some of the fears. I mean, you know, if Robert E. Lee hadn't been sneaky, they would have prosecuted him. If there were... There were a number of things that were going on that made it feel very existential to the South that they were going to become subservient states to the North. Right. And there is that, you know, that constant fight of states' rights versus federal. Um, We still see that interplay. You know, we're watching this happen 
live right now. This whole battle that actually we're getting ready to have at the moment uh, in the courts with relation to allowing Trump on their state ballots. Yes. And yes. them kicking him off. You know, ordinarily, precedents have said, you know, states' rights matter when it comes to voting. Got bad news for the states. The U is big now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it's going to, again, you're feeling that echo of that that tug of war that led to a very, very bloody battle and a dead president. So Montreal, Canada, we got to talk about Montreal a little bit because again, I mentioned before the Confederacy brass had a relationship and had an establishment. In fact, up in Montreal and Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy would actually wanted to use Montreal as a base where he could then attack the North through a series of guerrilla tactics. And many historians theorize that Booth met with members of Davis's Secret Service up there to plot the Lincoln kidnapping, though I guess it's debated how much Davis and other top officials knew about this plot. And many believe that most of Booth's interactions were sort of limited uh, to like a upper management or a, low, a lower level, mm -hmm. and that Davis himself wasn't interested in pursuing those underhanded tactics, which I found fascinating because Jefferson Davis seems like he wanted to win as a gentleman. Oh, yeah. We're not going to do these underhanded tactics of, you know, kidnapping well, and it the was president. Interesting. So there's uh, the Confederate Secret Service is also very interesting because people don't talk about it. No. There, it was both official and semi-official because of... You know, the unwillingness of some of the Southern leaders to do the really dirty stuff led to all these unofficial actions by, you know, it, when people say the CIA was rogue, the Confederate Secret Service was totally rogue. So oh, if yeah. you told me they plotted the whole thing, we eventually find out, I'd be like, sure, it makes sense. Do you know, what? like, did it dissolve pretty much with the Confederate Army or is there anybody no. that kind of... Oh, nope. oh, no, 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 no. So it's very interesting. So post Civil War, you know, if you like break it up into different groups and think of today, they had like their National Security Agency, which did all the signals intelligence. Then they had their like foreign intelligence agency, like the CIA, that did their foreign intelligence. And then they had their US, which operated in the Confederacy and operated in what we would call the union. But one of the interesting things about it is the signals core and the foreign part uh, dissipated, but the agents who mm. operated with the United States um, actually ended up being a part of it. And as you get into the John Wilkes Booth escape story, Ooh. one of the things is that Samuel Mudd, and this is disputed just like, his role in it's disputed, um, was a agent or officer of the Confederate Secret right. Service. And then when they got across the Potomac, I think it was uh, Pope's Creek, the boat that was hidden there that they used to cross the Potomac, another Confederate, either sympathizer that some people believe was in the Confederate Secret Service in Maryland is who they went to to help get them across the Potomac. So that is very believable because I think they would have yep. needed all the help they could get. And it's also widely believed that Booth himself was a spy and a courier for the Confederacy. And that makes total sense because he was desperate to kind of get in with these people and engineer plots with them. He would be willing to carry messages. He would be willing to facilitate any sort of intel. And he was a man of influence. So even if he wasn't high up the chain, he was definitely a player within the Confederate government. Well, back in like, let's see, this would have been late 1980s, two uh, retired CIA officers wrote this book on the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, come, what is it, come retribution. And in that, they made the circumstantial argument, right, which we all know are actually better than the direct arguments. But the circumstance, as we'll find out soon in the story, the circumstantial <laughs> argument that an intelligence, Confederate intelligence officer in Gordonsville, Virginia, Booth was an agent of this officer, and he actually came up with the idea 
of kidnapping and holding oh. um, Lincoln hostage in in order to pressure the North to give up the world. And the name of the book, Come Retribution, is the supposed code, code name um, for the operation. And the, the theory behind it is when the kidnapping wouldn't work, their second plan, they make this argument, was to actually bomb the White House. Wow. And when that didn't work, when that also failed, the Confederate Secret Service dropped the whole thing, which then left Booth as a rogue agent leading to the assassination. So that's that's their that's their theory. It makes sense because as we'll see with the conspirators, a lot of them were I and I I mean, of course, a lot of them would make this claim just to save themselves, but I think it's it's quite believable that they wouldn't know that Booth had flipped the script because it's not like they had, you know, cell phones to instantly communicate this stuff. They were not in the same company doing a lot of the things. I mean, they had the boarding house that they would kind of meet at or exchange messages at and things like that. But this is not the kind of thing that you can instantly communicate a change in plans like, hey, guys. Correct. Or you do, and your agent's still so invested in it that they carry it on their own. Right. And I think one thing to keep in mind, one thing historically to keep in mind, because we like to look at it black and white. The Civil War was not over for Robert E. Lee or no, Jefferson Davis. They were still fighting. <laughs> they, yeah. Right. Because you know what? They were both looking at the gallows. Yes. So there were still reasons, even once Confederate military victory was impossible, Mm -hmm. For them to still, not to say there's any evidence that they were involved in it, but it's one of the things to just keep in mind that it's not like a war ends, you click your fingers and it's all over. Right, right. Even even in World War II, that you still had fighting going on in the Southern Pacific, even yep. after, you know, Japan surrenders. I mean, years the, and years and years. It, it takes it takes time. And the further back in time you go, the yeah, the longer it takes to get the memo uh, that, hey, we can stop fighting. You know, I think they were still fighting in like Oklahoma and stuff, even after most of the war had been considered done. Yeah. So they were still fighting. There were still tiny little skirmishes and uh, fires put up for many years to come. Um, and, you know, the kidnapping plot, it did seem to be abandoned when it became clear the South was about to surrender in early 1865. Do you know when the last Japanese soldier resigned? I mean, um, surrendered? The last surrendered? No, I don't. Okay. You know when World War II ended? Uh, 1945. Right? Yeah. 1974. He was in the Philippines jungle. Yes. You know, so that ought to tell you. Hiro Onado. Yes. And I I would wonder, I'm pretty sure. nine years. And when it comes to the Civil War, many would argue there are many that still have not surrendered. They're carrying the flags today. <laughs> that is true. That uh, is true. But yeah, on, on so on April 11th of 1865, Lincoln gave a speech where he indicated his intent to grant former slaves the, abil the ability to vote. And Booth apparently became enraged. And that's when he flip flopped over to an assassination Don't you mean plot. Became more enraged. More enraged. <laughs> as if there's, you know, it's possible to become more enraged. He, yeah, he was like, this, I'm done with this guy. We're not kidnapping anymore. And so the following day on April 12th was when General Robert E. Lee surrendered. And then two days after that, on April 14th, 1865, Good Friday, to be exact, Booth would learn that Lincoln and his wife Mary would attend a showing of Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater with General and Mrs. Ulysses S. Grant. And do you know how crazy this is? He just happened to be walking by the mailbox. Yes. When yes. the theater owner, who was friends with his family... Happened to mention Lincoln was coming. Yeah. And Booth was a regular player at this theater. He could come and go as he pleased. Mm -hmm. And again, to talk about all the star-crossed elements here, this is one of them. And it was at this event that American history would tilt again on its axis with the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. What a week. What a week that was indeed. And I think this is a good time to wind things down. We've hopefully set up for you a good picture of the time, the place, the culture, and the overall mood of a man so angered by the losses of his beloved Confederacy that he was willing to kill a president for it. 
There is so much more waiting in next week's episode of Vintage Villains. What all went down in Ford's Theater and elsewhere that fateful night when not only Abraham Lincoln's life was on the line, but that of two others in his line of succession? And what all went down in the wild days that followed Lincoln's death? Join Jason and me for the conclusion of the story of John Wilkes Booth here next week. Though, while you're waiting, if you wanted to pop over to Apple and give Vintage Villains and Jason's show, The Silver Linings Handbook, a five-star review, we would both love you for it. The show notes also contain links to our websites and other social media, where friendly faces await to welcome you into our shared community of friends and enthusiasts. Take care, my friends, and I'll see you next week in another century.